All right, this morning, uh, concluding this series, I'd like to talk about science and the paranormal. Uh, the 17th century Benedictine priest, Joseph of Cupertino, was observed levitating or flying by thousands of people. Joseph would most likely today be labeled mentally challenged or disabled. It was, uh, he barely got into the priesthood. At times he would be seen transfixed in a mystical state, during which time he would rise off of the ground, according to witnesses. Sometimes he would fly a few feet for a few seconds. Other times he was observed flying for several minutes, covering up to 30 yards or more. Those who witnessed this weird phenomena included skeptics who came to see Joseph. And even those who were hostile to the proposition that this dull-witted monk had this supernatural capacity. And again, according to the testimony, thousands witnessed this. Now, I guess, uh, by the way, this is probably where the flying nun came from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, at his, at his trial, the humanist friend of Voltaire, Prospero Lambertini, held court. Lambertini was openly hostile to Joseph and this preposterous claim that he could fly. Yet even the disbelieving Lambertini was forced to recognize the claims about Joseph after hearing the preponderance of testimonies by eyewitnesses. Accounts of levitation are numerous in world religions. I have spoken to people who have been to India who claim to have seen pundits levitate. Now, of course, many supposed cases of levitation have been shown to be hoax, a hoax. But the case of Joseph of uh, Copertino has been accepted by several in the academic community as valid. There's something going on. I have always personally been skeptical about the miraculous and skeptical about paranormal phenomena. Phony faith healers, and Christians who talk about experiencing miracles, uh, is a, in fact, kind of turned me off as a believer. It seems like some of these uh, testimonies of miracles becomes a competition uh, about a testimony so who can tell the most outlandish, spectacular story. Now, uh, I have to recognize also that I'm also a product of this skeptical, monophasic, Western Enlightenment culture. Uh, I'm a trained historian, trained to be skeptical about these things. And, uh, and again, I still tend not to be all that open to such phenomena. But science and quantum mechanics in particular is forcing me to rethink the nature of reality. The implications of quantum mechanics, especially in regard to consciousness, as we've, as we've been talking about, have shown the limitations of materialistic or physicalistic <coughs> interpretations of the universe and life. And keep in mind that materialism or physicalism continue to inform many in science and atheist, even though materialism is being discounted in large part. Science has exposed our most basic ideas of reality have been insufficient. Matter, the stuff that we're very familiar with, and material existence, as understood by classical physics, has been demonstrated not to exist. So it's time to let go of the old models. This is why a math, uh, mathematical physicist like Henry Stapp 
says, our conscious minds play an important role in completing quantum dynamics. In other words, there's a new reality because of science. The new reality has opened the door for non-material or spiritual realities. And as I've said, for God talk. For example, we can no longer with any confidence say that our physical brains generate consciousness. In fact, it may be more realistic to say, based upon the evidence, to conclude that our brains actually get in the way of unmediated experience with ultimate reality. Especially when we are a part of a culture that has been conditioned to reject mystical experiences and altered states of consciousness or powerful religious experiences that I've mentioned before. Could it be that mystical experience, religious experience, could be a deeper, more direct perception into ultimate reality? Quantum mechanics suggests that may be true. The neuroscientist John Eccles says that, that we cannot connect our primary experience of life in reality to brain function alone. When William James, a famous psychologist, said, our brains filter our mind's experience, he's talking about something that's already there, the mind. Mind being a non-material aspect of human experience, consciousness, a spiritual aspect of human consciousness. But brain and mind are separate. You can no longer, we, we can no longer reduce the physical brain, or the, the mind, to, to the physical brain. Jeffrey Schwartz, an, a medical doctor at UCLA, makes that point over and over again when he, he's dealt in the laboratory after 20 years of dealing with obsessive uh, compulsive behavior. In fact, before a lecture at UCLA, to one of my classes, he told me, I'm going to show them slides of MRIs and how mental thought has actually changed the physical brain of my patients, the neuroplasticity. And he said, he followed by saying, and they're not going to believe it. And I says, what do you mean they're not going to believe it? He says, these young people, these students, these college, university students are not going to believe it because they've been conditioned not to. They will reject the science because of the influence that culture has on them. You just, the mental thought cannot possibly change the physical brain. So that's part of what we're dealing with here. This fact alone, that mind uh, cannot be reduced to brain, this fact alone should transform our concepts of reality. Physical matter does not produce consciousness. It may limit it, in fact. <clears throat> Long time ago, Plato said to practice melite thanatu, which is to practice death. In other words, so that the, the mind, the spiritual, might come to life. It's now been recognized that Darwin failed to account for the rise of human consciousness in nature. And a leading uh, philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who I've mentioned before, has written a book talking about this failure. Materialism is surely wrong, and we need to come to terms with reality and life and non-materialistic understandings. Yet, neuroscientific reductionism continues to limit all human perception and experience to biology and psychology. Social scientists, like myself, may add the role of culture, but the quantum world has blown the lid off, and human experience defy this type of facile reductionism that can all be explained away in material terms or by the physical brain. For example, the paranormal, and by the way, my field of religious studies has essentially ignored the paranormal including myself in my own professional work. 
Now, not all scholars are ignoring, ignoring the paranormal, by the way, from a variety of different disciplines. Things like reincarnation, uh, especially involving the studies of young children. One uh, department of psychology uh, has done uh, at least uh, two and a half decades of work. And uh, just to give you one example, uh, a small boy that they worked with had a, was born with a deformed right hand. And they showed this child, uh, I think he was the age of uh, five or six, they showed him a picture uh, of a couple generations before. And there was a, a, group, a group of farmers standing in front of a threshing machine. He'd never seen this picture before, and the child says, there I am. And he pointed to a great-grandfather whose hand had been thrashed in a farming accident. And so over and over and over again, we have examples like this. Now, when the, the, the psychologist was asked, is there anything to this? He said, 20 years ago when I started this, he, he said, I would have said no. But after 20 years of looking at this, there's definitely something to this. Also, for example, in the paranormal, automatic writing. Has anybody ever heard of automatic writing? The Oxford philosopher F.C.S. Schiller had a brother. Schiller's brother demonstrated automatism, in this case, automatic writing, where the writer is typically unaware of the content of his or her, her writing. While fully conscious and engaged in some other activity, like reading a book or telling a story, they write. Schiller's brother at times wrote with both hands simultaneously. By the way, he was not amphidectorous. His right hand wrote one, on one subject, while his left hand, in perfect penmanship, wrote on a totally different topic. And some of the topics that Schiller's br brother wrote on, he had no knowledge of. Anna Windsor, wrote while sleeping. It's been documented. Sometimes she wrote in Latin. Anna didn't know a word of Latin. Now, if you believe in materialism or physicalism, then the explanation for particles communicating with one another instantaneously, billions of light years apart, is hard to deal with if you're a materialist. It shatters any explanation. Or if you're a materialist and people seeing and speaking with recently the recently dead resurrection appearances, then that's also very difficult to explain from a materialist point of view. And by the way, resurrection appearances continue today. A recently <coughs> departed loved one has been documented to show up to a group of people and everybody sees him, and everybody hears him say the same thing. This is document. Or automatic writing, as I've given you a couple examples. Or altered states of consciousness, like the Apostle Paul had, when he claims he met the risen Jesus. People continue to have powerful altered states of consciousness. And not always because they're taking some drug or something. And on and on and on. Different types of paranormal experiences that scientists from various fields are looking at seriously and that also challenge the idea of materialism. So I would say materialism in these examples defy outdated models of reality that we have been conditioned to accept. I mean, if, you, if, if you're a materialist, then I guess you believe that the answer to these things is coming down the pike in some type of materialistic explanation. One of the explanations, for example, is that there are unlimited parallel universes. How many? An infinite amount of universes. Because you need an infinite amount of parallel universes to explain this type of phenomenon. 
By the way, that is not a scientific theory. It cannot be falsified. It's a belief. It's what you're forced to do if you still want to embrace a materialistic viewpoint or a physicalist, physicalist viewpoint. And by the way, is that hard to believe? An infinite number of parallel universes where right now somebody like me is talking and in one of those universes they're wearing a red coat. And another one, I didn't mispronounce one of the words I mispronounced earlier. That's, not, that's, that's pretty hard to believe in. So it takes faith to be a materialist. 95% of our universe is made up of something we don't understand. 95%. Consciousness continues to elude the best brains on the planet. And science still does not have a clue about where consciousness comes from. Don't, we don't have a clue. We, scientists say we don't have any idea. Religious experiences are real. They're profound. The world and life remains wonderfully mysterious. Who or what is behind all this? Well, it's a matter of faith. Whether you're a materialist or whether you, you're a, you believe in God. And by the way, to postulate a creator behind the mysteries and the wonderment of life may be the most rational of all the postulates that we have in view of science. I hope this has been helpful.